Okay, hey, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining this afternoon. I, I think I got to look at my watch here. It looks like we're on the top of the hour. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for taking the time out of your day to, to this afternoon to join us to, for this discussion on Wargaming. Uh, we want to make this fun and exciting. This is for you guys that are, are dialed in from the community. Uh, and I can see from the, the participants, we got a good mix of friends uh, from the interagency, from, from multiple components, and from the, inter, from the different services. So it's a really good mix here. And so we hope we can get, make this useful for all of you. Um, so I'm going to introduce the speakers and uh, just kind of go over what we're going to do. Um, they'll, I'll have, uh, so starting with Dr. Ben Jensen, he is the, uh, both are good friends, but Dr. Ben Jensen and I go way back and um, from the CSA Strategic Studies Group as fellows. Um, he's currently now uh, teaching at Marine Corps University, as well as the uh, senior fellow at uh, the Center for Strategic Studies, uh, Center for International Strategic Studies, CSIS, the senior fellow for Future War Gaming Strategy and International Programs. Um, he's got a, a, you know, a really long CV. Um, you can see in the in the handout that's been sent out to everybody, so I don't want to go into too much depth there, and I'll let Ben introduce himself if there's anything else he wants to point out. And then I have also um, Dr. Tom Nagel, a former uh, Army officer, um, Army strategist, and now um, working for uh, CENTCOM in some kind of capacity on the side, and the creator for Warpaths with Strategy Connections. And so what we want to do is we, we're going to talk about, let me just drop Ben. So we're going to talk about war gaming, but honestly, we're talking about you know, simulations and gaming across this entire spectrum of uh, top of the competition. And so we're going to talk about some tools, some techniques, and really what we'll, we'll do is I'll turn it over to Ben. He'll talk for a little bit, and then Tom will talk about Warpaths, and then hope we can open this up and have a conversation about these different techniques and tools and make this about you guys that are in the audience. And so without further ado, I'll hand over to hopefully Ben's still on there. If not, we'll switch over to, to Tom first. But Ben, you still on? I am. I had to actually reestablish my audio. Can you hear me and see me? We got you, brother. I'll Perfect. stop sharing and uh, kick it over to you to talk about all the great stuff you're doing in CSIS and uh, with DARPA and all that. All the, can't keep up with you, man. You got so much going on. Uh, well, I mean, you know, first, thank you for having me here today. Um, truth in lending, I am an Army officer, although I'm an intelligence type, so I'm a little worried about talking to a civil affairs group. You guys going to tell me you don't do intel or something? Yeah. Screw that noise. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what I'm going to, oh, there we go. Thanks, Mr. Boyd. Hey, what I want to do is Arnell asked me to talk about some of the civil affairs dimensions of gaming that I've been doing. And I'm going to talk about that, not just from a CSIS perspective um, or in relation to some of the work I'm going to do at DARPA, but I'm going to kind of take you on a trajectory really for the last five years of war games. And, and I hate to call them a war game because most of these aren't really about war. They're about competition. They're about undergoverned spaces. They're about what Krulak and the Marine Corps would have called three block warfare. They're about all the stuff that I fear we're gonna forget to focus on as we rush to imagine great power conflict between the US and China and ignore the most likely scenario that will be involved in these very contentious proxy struggles, counterinsurgency, counterterror, or even, you know, what's going on in Ukraine, kind of uh, foreign military sales plus heavy on security force assistance mission. So I want to really kind of lay out a series of kind of game designs that I've developed, honestly, haphazardly um, over the last five years in response to that kind of space. And, and the journey will kind of end with the discussion of where I see the way forward um, with some initiative that I'll invite anyone on this call to participate in that I'll be pursuing with DARPA at CSIS. So, um, all my experience with gaming goes back like most of you kind of initiated first as an army officer into the good old fashioned box belt avenue in depth action reaction counteraction build a nice synchronization matrix don't take too long war games. Um, and then as a PhD candidate, I began to really study the military profession and ended up really beginning to kind of dabble in gaming first as a professor to kind of help students expose themselves to grappling with opportunity costs and decision-making under uncertainty, which seemed a bit more nuanced than my experience with army games. Maybe you have a better luck. And I kept going back and forth to games, both as an army officer and then as a scholar, really over the last 19 years. And really only in the last like six or seven started to view 
war games has a viable social science path to help people generate hypotheses about war, but then also to analyze the inherent trade-offs that come whenever you're trying to use violence or manage violence in pursuit of political objectives. Um, and in particular, doing it less about, and I do a lot of those games too, China invading Taiwan or a Korea scenario, really began to only look at the games in the kind of space that are more, I think, civil affairs focused, um, really through a trip to West Africa. So I got invited to come to ECOWAS really starting in 2018 to start to help them develop what was called the Response and Early Warning Initiative for West Africa. This is very civil affairs like. So USAID and state had given uh, money to the Economic Organization of West African States to actually set up an early warning system to monitor human security crisis events um, across the ECOWAS member states in West Africa. Now, interestingly enough, this was actually um, done through a series of civil society organizations and local university partnerships. So what you had are locals analyzing 54 different variables. Um, I hadn't, I didn't make the variables. It was mostly team before me. They had made a series of data analytical points um, better than our old district stability framework type stuff that allowed locals, so high context local information to be able to scrutinize what was actually going on in these areas and to see if they could predict through a change in the ordinal scale associated with each variable, whether or not there would be a human security crisis. So if you, you didn't know it, human security is the idea that the reference for security is not the state, but the individual. And the reason ECOWAS had committed heavily wasn't just because a lot of the events they were looking at weren't just about states, transnational groups, um, health concerns, um, corruption concerns. It was also because the Japanese foreign ministry gave them a boatload of money and backs human security perspective. So I'd like to say it was just forward thinking and altruistic, but you know, you always have to follow the money in the development space. So they had 54 variables. I think it was six, six different categories of human security crisis. Now what had happened over the, a couple of years is they found that they were pooling all of this data, but they didn't know what to do with it. Um, so working with creative associates, um, and another organization, I was brought in to help them develop an analytical framework. And to do that, we started to do games around fake countries. Now, we started to use fake countries in that context because it was too politically charged to say the Gambia or Togo um, or northern Nigeria um, or even just, you know, the, F F uh, the Fulanis, the nomadic group that cuts across the Sahel and transhumans, former herd of conflict. So we actually tried to create a fake country that replicated a lot of the crisis events they were interested in. And then we actually worked with the different directorates across ECOWAS to actually see how they would respond to those to help them move from collecting data to doing analysis to planning crisis interventions. Um, so that's the first kind of tale of what I think are civil affairs linked games are how do you help organizations, whether it's you as part of a small team that's forward in a country, whether it's you as part of a larger kind of constellation of US government and partner organizations um, actually makes sense of human terrain. Um, I think you do not, you know, if, if you don't know who you are, who they are, and where you are, every action you do risks being self defeating and cascading. So, how do you help people begin to understand how to make sense of local information? exchange, and I think is one of the really premium tasks and truly underappreciated. I know it's not underappreciated by the people who are, you know, at a civil affairs workshop, but it is, I think, you know, I'll say this in my intelligence hat, it's the type of information where we have massive analytical blind spots in terms of how we focus on red and often miss what's going on in green. So that was really my first kind of foray into this type of gaming. I'll be honest, I was addicted. I kept signing up to do these consulting gigs to go back to West Africa. Um, and I ended up working with them all the way up into the pandemic. But it kind of gave me an idea for a different approach to gaming, a different approach to you know, not necessarily action, reaction, counteraction in terms of assessing relative combat power or coefficients of power or OWS tables about does cyber or ISR multiply your ability to fire an Alrazm, but really a way of 
allowing people to clarify their understanding and arguments about how they think groups will interact. So games became a way of forcing people to be analytically rigorous in how they would generate arguments and almost creating kind of with history as a, as a collection of is a natural laboratory, a collection of past events that you can kind of do thought experiments in. I know historians think about that as abusing it, but that's how we use it as a military profession. A game becomes a synthetic environment in which you can try to replicate decision-making under uncertainty and the inherent trade-offs people see, and then evaluate your own expected utility and risk propensity. I think a lot of times we assume things will work or we assume um, a way of risk or we overinflate another risk because we never force ourselves to really scrutinize it, right? Even the way we um, do composite risk management wouldn't survive even an undergraduate um, business class in terms of how finance has moved on to thinking about risk. So games in this space, when you have higher degrees of complexity, that three body problem of transitory red, we'll call them even pink because they're not even always a threat. Groups interacting with the environment, interacting with you or people that you're supporting, create these emergent properties and games helps you kind of approximate some of those insurgent properties. So that was kind of the first game story I will tell um, is ECOWAS and really how you can use um, game design to do that. If I had to think of some lessons learned from it, it's less is more. Most people over-engineer a game and they make it too complex, but the pl let the players bring the complexity. If you have the right number of players, the right type of players, and you ask them simple questions that allow you to compare their answers, you're building a simple foundation that will allow you to have a much more um, interesting set of findings that you can analyze. And you can analyze those findings textually. I've done that where you have gather everyone's um, responses into a program like in vivo and do textual analysis or content analytics, or you can even force people kind of a variant of rigid Kriegspiel to make discrete choices, right? Choose your rank order, um, which you can get to interval or, you know, pick A, B, C, or D, a categorical or even ordinal variable. And then you can do ANOVA or even T stats to actually compare the distribution of responses. So I think the first rule of thumb is get the right people, ask the right questions and keep it simple. Let the players bring the complexity. Don't over-engineer the game. Uh, based upon my experience there, after a deployment to help shut down Afghanistan, I came back and found um, a group called DT Institute, DT Global, which is actually founded, I think, by a West Pointer who was a civil affairs officer at one point, de Blasio. Um, so his organization brought me in to first run a game about the, what Afghanistan would look like one year after collapse. But more important for this audience was the last two that we did. So one was called Fridonia Dawn. And the second one, which I literally just got back in the last couple of days from Prague doing, was called Advancing Democracy in the Gray Zone. So DT Institute has been working with USAID. And in particular, there's a new organization in USAID that's doing a lot of interesting work around countering mistis and malinformation and looking at other ways of using information technology and innovation to promote civil society and reassure democratic resilience. So as part of the democracy summit, I think it was two months ago now, they had me build a game around a fake country, Fridonia, where we had a network of authoritarian states, <laughs> Russia, China, um, and then a network of democratic states that were each competing for access and influence um, in these spaces. And so what we did there was really force people to think more at the level, less as you would in a civil affairs team, but more if you were inside the embassy uh, working, whether at the country team or back home in a national capital or regional bureau, assessing what type of programs you would want to invest in and really trying to understand this idea of how do you advance your interests and your interest being in um, open access, anti-corruption, promotion of human rights, um, in the gray zone where you have actors like Russia, either operating paramilitary groups like Wagner, Witness Mali and Operation Barbicane now ending for the French, um, or you had actors like China using debt trap diplomacy and even economic coercion to try to actually undermine uh, local governments from within. How does our kind of 90s, which is still frankly dated and it feels like it, um, development and democracy playbook square up against authoritarians that are taking advantage of high-end information technology, 
very shadowy paramilitary organizations and modern economic instruments to basically gain a foothold and involve themselves in everything from illegal mining to buying access to ports. Um, and so DT had me run that game. We did it with a bunch of uh, democracy promotion groups. And then we just did a second round where we really did it focused more on um, Actually, it was less a fake country, and we did a very specific look at countering Russia and China in Central and Eastern Europe. So actually trying to understand, instead of a fake country, Fredonia, how they would make these. And in that case, it was about 40 people, and we brought together kind of um, a mix of folks from the Czech government who counter hybrid threats to NATO representatives from Brussels to, you know, um, small startups that focused on web scraping to identify mistis and malinformation. So again, game design parameters, we kept it simple. The idea was to force people to articulate programs in a way that allowed us to compare what the authoritarian and democratic states were doing, and then by forcing them to make discrete choices to see that they focus on one country or one issue area over another. And that means a lot of time, the next rule of gaming is it requires great facilitation. You have to stay calm. You have to be able to ask people to clarify their logic. And re most of us talk out loud without making an argument in advance. So that can be a little awkward sometimes because the person thinks it sounds great coming out of their mouth. The second rule that we end up uh, putting in there is a belief of individual versus group instrumentation. So every game we run in this space, we first have an individual round where we get people to fill out some sheet with a rigid choice and trade-off horizon. And then we turn it over to the group. And the reason to do that is when we harvest those anonymous sheets at the end, it allows us to capture the introvert's perspective and then compare you know, where it allows us to basically get a larger end from a statistical standpoint. So if I have like 20 groups in red, 20 individuals on red, 20 on the blue team, now instead of just running one game, I can actually analyze and a 40 and a 20 for red, 20 for blue in multiple iterations and see how they respond to one another. So another benefit of that is it increases your number of observations when I do any statistics on. Um, I would rather talk openly with you than just talk at my phone about game design, but break, break, what have we mentioned? Um, really over the last six or seven years, starting to use games to help people refine arguments about working in the development democracy promotion space very similar to some of the civil affairs types of activities, and then really focused on how they interact with uh, not red or blue, but green. And in particular, how interactions amongst the population or the human terrain are increasingly complicated by these larger great power competition through the gray zone and using games to identify it. The next step will be working with DARPA and there's gonna have some funding uh, should be coming soon here at CSIS. We're actually gonna look at how we measure and evaluate active campaigning and competition. So more to follow on that. And someone's got a hot mic, so I'm gonna stop and turn it over to questions. I think I saw one pop up in the comment field no, yeah two of them Ben, thanks for that that's you nailed yeah. it brother. those are some great points um so really appreciate that overview of what you're doing um mr basir go ahead and fire off your question um ask uh, ben. thank you very thank you very much uh colonel david uh so uh, professor jensen thank you uh for the wonderful work that you're doing so i'll just uh, go to the question right away so do games in the form of a hackathon where you have considerable pressure, limited time, and uh, extreme concentration works best, or do long view spread over time, asynchronous in which they would contribute works better, or perhaps you may just say both. Thank you. No, great question. Again, the game design parameter depends upon your ability to get good groups. So most of the, most of the games I've run lately um, are about a half a day to a full day and very focused. So they have a hack on like pressure um, and it's really time compressed. Now, I do think there is something to slow, deliberate, iterated games that evolve over time, uh, but usually the DC crowd wants to be in and out in half a day. And even then you're struggling to stop people from disappearing into their phone, especially after lunch, over. Thank you, yeah, thanks. thanks for that question. Thanks, Ben. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm uh, gonna turn it over to Tom to discuss uh, what he's doing with Warpaths, but to set him up, I just wanna share um, why I asked Tom to come along um, and how it might help us as civil affairs professionals or as uh, the interagencies. Uh, when we, for, we worked together in, when I was in the United Kingdom on uh, 
helping create Warpaths. And uh, Tom had built this fascinating uh, matrix game facilitation tool for, you know, for, it can be used at multiple levels. And we use it at the strategic level. So our initial game was pretty big. It was uh, asynchronous across six time zones with 60 plus players across the, you know, the UK armed forces, but as well as the, their Whitehall, their office, their Secretary of State for Defense Policy. So like OSDP equivalent and uh, just a, a real mix of uh, academics and military practitioners. And we had a wonderful game over six weeks. Um, and, and then we did it again just recently. Tom helped us out here at the Joint Advanced Warfighting School where we ran a use warpaths again. And, and the development since the last time I did it has been pretty, it's been pretty great. And he's built in a lot of different features and stuff. So it'd be great to, I thought it'd be great to have him share with us this tool, which I think can help us out in our community at different, uh, at, at all levels. So uh, over to you, Tom. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Uh, so if I could, uh, before I get into my slides here, uh, one thing I'd like to highlight in terms of my experience or, or my interest in games is more from the internal decision dynamics uh, of any organization, kind of as an innovation tool. Um, I think you heard Ben talk about, um, you know, challenging some of the perspectives that uh, exist inside of an organization. And I think that's kind of the, the path that I would like to go down on, on this discussion. Um, you know, wargaming is just a great way to, to, to challenge assumptions that uh, any organization has, ha has uh, because of their, you know, why they are built, their purposes uh, for which they are built to accomplish. They tend to view things through that particular lens. Uh, and a lot of times we get into this groove thinking where um, we will tend to evaluate opportunities, risks, costs, et cetera, uh, only through the lens of our own uh, organization. And I think wargaming is a great tool to kind of break out of that pattern uh, and uh, and try to bring in that new perspective, especially when you've got participants uh, in the war game that aren't afraid to share um, some you know challenging perspectives that that'll challenge kind of the the, uh, the the accepted wisdom in the organization. So that that's kind of hard to do, but I think war gaming is at least a forum where it makes that uh, easier rather than in a decision meeting uh, with a four star. So with that, let me bring up my slides uh, and uh, I'll. All right. So, so on that note, uh, I think uh, it's important to point out why I think wargaming is useful for civil affairs or really any or any type of capability uh, across DOD, uh, which is specialized, uh, maybe smaller than you know the combat arms when you come to the table and you, and you're bringing something um, specialized, uh, any intel, uh, information operations, civil affairs. Um, you know, making sure that the, your arguments are sharp and carry weight uh, in such large forums when you're kind of competing for airtime uh, is important. And I think wargaming is one way to, to sharpen those arguments. Uh, they are strategic arguments about cause and effect. Uh, if this, then that. Uh, I think it forces you to think through, you know, what the potential uh, responses might be to any um, actions you may take. And you have to think through the second and third order implications uh, of what you may be able uh, to accomplish. Um, you know, everything that you set out to do may have some downsides, which uh, your organization may be reluctant to explore. Um, but uh, again, Wargaming bring, provides that forum where uh, people feel a little safer to, to try to explore those ideas. Um, and it also facilitates debate, which kind of forces you to defend your assertions with any justifications, especially at the strategic level where you're doing something like a matrix war game, uh, where you have to talk about <clears throat> your justifications for the uh, for the actions that you're taking. Taking. It also forces you to communicate with audiences uh, that don't necessarily agree um, beyond the organizational um, uh, implicate or, or in tendency to view things through a, one particular lens. When you break people out into red, blue, and green, uh, you're forcing them to approach the competitive space with uh, with kind of a conflicting view of how things uh, are going to play out. So it uh, forces you to communicate with audiences that don't agree with you uh, simply because of the way that the game is set up. So to kind of uh, I've got a couple of slides that I just like to explore this idea uh, of this executive decision model where you've got a couple of specialized uh, people advising uh, an executive decision maker, a commander, a president, uh, a business executive. Uh, we find this type of situation um, quite a bit in, in any kind of large organization where you've got a key decision maker with, or, with advisors that tend to be biased 
um, because of their individual experiences and also because of where they sit um, or because of where they stand depends on where you, where they sit in the bureaucratic organization. Uh, so let's just accept that uh, when we're talking about a bias uh, that uh, an advisor with a preferred course of action is going to overestimate the benefits uh, of a preferred course of action as well as underestimate those costs. And this immediately brings up some challenges where we have multiple people in the room and that you have framing effects. The first people that can, or the first person that frames the uh, the problem for the decision maker is going to kind of carry the day because they can set the terms of the arguments. And you've also got the 51% problem where even if you realize um, that your uh, option may not be the best, but you believe in it 51% uh, of your of your being, uh, you have to argue it as if you believe it and 100% as if you believe it 100% because by the time you get to that decision making meeting, you're going to get rolled by the people that are absolutely certain about the benefits of their actions. Um, so you've got a problem for the that executive in trying to figure out what is the truth on the ground. How do you determine what's the best way to approach this problem? Uh, and there's a couple of keys to success, which I think mesh well with Wargame. And this is kind of the, the way that I wanted to kind of close this idea out. Um, and that when you've got when you're playing a war game, there's obviously multiple options that have to be considered, uh, especially when you take one particular problem set uh, and ideally you war game it multiple times, which of course is a problem uh, because of the time that everybody has to uh, devote to the game. Uh, getting everybody's schedule cleared. But ideally, you should have multiple options considered in a wargaming process, and you start to identify trends over multiple wargames, especially when you've got a large uh, strategic uh, decision that has to be made that carries a lot of uh, weight uh, down the road. When you have that public debate um, in the in a war game setting, it kind of shifts the incentives where you know you you know that your uh, weaknesses are going to be exposed by people that are not going to agree with you and will challenge your arguments in the war game. So that information that's coming up about weaknesses, uh, risks, things that hadn't been considered when a, when a course of action was initially decided upon, uh, that information is being surfaced for that key decision maker that's listening in on this debate and he's starting to learn, he or she is starting to learn more about uh, the different perspectives that may exist on that problem set. Uh, repeated revisiting is important, like I said, uh, but obviously it's costly in terms of the number of times you can do it uh, with uh, um, the, the time involved with uh, people that uh, are, tend to be busy. All right, just to kind of close out this idea um, of what this is known as in international relations is multiple advocacy, where you've got uh, multiple options competing for a decision, um, and we want to, over the course of multiple uh, revisiting of the decision, bring up different options where weaknesses are exposed and ideally you start to mitigate out these different biases and you, you start to converge on what the reality is or a sharper understanding of the conditions on the ground, which, uh, which as you know, are sometimes hard to determine. But there's a couple of conditions that are necessary for this to happen. There has to be unlike biases involved. If everybody believes the same thing and you conduct a, a war game, you're not going to get those competing perspectives that are required to revise estimates uh, and get a better understanding of what's playing out. Um, repeated debates are best, but they're very hard, as I said. Um, and uh, this public debate forces uh, the forces people to reveal information. Uh, and allows everybody to update their estimates based on that information that uh, otherwise would remain hidden uh, in a simple course of action recommendation. Um, so like I said, people will tend to anticipate weaknesses, they'll moderate their estimates of benefits and kind of right size their estimates of costs and in, in anything that uh, they're recommending. And Wargaming is a good forum to bring out these, uh, these dynamics, which kind of add up to, uh, to the best best possible model of, uh, of decision making for consequential uh, uh, strategic situations. All right, I'm going to transition over to talking briefly about WordPads and then we'll, uh, you know, break for the questions. WordPads is a browser based platform for doing distributed matrix war games, either synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, ideally, you start to you're able to do these either on laptops or smartphones, depending on the um, uh, the uh, what type of game you're running, if it's synchronous or asynchronous. For asynchronous, you can run it on uh, smartphones as well. Um, and then it's the, the intent is to give you user level control of the game scenario teams, the situation basically lower the barriers to entry to uh, war gaming, where we tend to think of these uh, strategic level war games as huge events uh, that require multiple invites and a huge conference room and, uh, and three day uh, events. 
But in reality, uh, the, uh, the best uh, situation is, you know, you, you lower the barriers to conducting these war games with a customized scenario that meet your requirements and you're able to do this kind of on the fly multiple times, switch out your players. And that's kind of what this was built to do. And finally, there's just a couple of key concepts that are built into this. Uh, Warpaz is focused on changing conditions that are represented by colors uh, at the state or sub-state level um, on the map. Um, and this is obviously focused at the strategic level um, across the dime uh, and uh, multiple arguments give you the opportunity to explore you know, military, informational, diplomatic, economic actions, uh, et cetera. So I think that this met, meets or meshes well with any type of war game that you're conducting on the gray zone, um, uh, information operations, humanitarian, civil affairs. So these conditions-based um, things are really what uh, uh, Warpath kind of excels at and, and is built for. So I will, let me move this off to the side. All right, so right now what you're looking at is the main interface for Warpaths, and I'll just briefly point out kind of what, how, what this is built to do, uh, and then we'll transition over to um, uh, any questions. So this is uh, an interactive map, uh, and you can see the colors that are on here represent conditions, um, and you can define these conditions in your white cell area. So when I click on them, you can see the condition information. This is how things are defined. There's icons that represent uh, units uh, as well as incidents. Um, it's uh, built to allow you to in inject incidents into the game pretty quickly. Um, and if I click on the map, you can see it'll bring up a, a list of incidents uh, that uh, you can uh, create and insert into the game turn by turn. Um, it's interactive. You can set this for a default view anywhere in the world that you'd like. If you want to zoom into a particular city, if you're conducting a war game that's focused in on uh, one particular city in Africa, for example, or obviously this uh, demo is set uh, more at the strategic level where we're looking at state level data and admin one level data or one level down from the state. Um, there is uh, over, I'm looking at this right now from, uh, from a white cell perspective, which gives me kind of a God view uh, of the entire map and allows me to, uh, to change anything on the map uh, during, the, during, the, uh, during the game. The main, uh, arg the main game is kind of driven by the arguments uh, that you see down here. Um, and this is set up right now for the dime format that I mentioned. So slightly different than a traditional uh, matrix war game in that you identify a single strategic effect and you identify those actions that you need to take uh, to in, order, in order to achieve that effect. And you can have up to three arguments per, uh, per turn. The game supports blue, um, red, as well as green elements or green uh, uh, allies. And you can uh, identify the specific teams that you'd like to have play in, in each one of those. Um, and then the country impacts as the arguments come in are those things that I mentioned up here uh, and the changing conditions. Um, and over the course of the game, you can see how uh, these things will change turn by turn. Um, and this is set up so that you can view the entire history of the game as things play out, as well as any of the arguments that came in. Along with that, finally, I'll close out with some of the, uh, the back, you know, you've got slides for backgrounds. If you want to include uh, um, links to videos, you can do that. Create team strategies, uh, run surveys, um, along with responses during the game. Uh, there's a message system for the internal team across allies and direct messages, which kind of give you that, uh, that back channel communication uh, between red and blue. Uh, if necessary, as well as kind of an administrative channel where the white can uh, converse with all the teams simultaneously. And turn by turn uh, Intel updates that are tied to uh, each individual uh, turn where you can create, um, you know, your detailed uh, incidents that you want to expand on that are uh, represented as icons in the map or um, include hyperlinks in here to, to link out to a real world uh, situation if you're playing kind of a long term asynchronous game. So that's just kind of a flavor of what this is uh, built to do. This can be, like I said, asynchronous or synchronous. Um, most of the uh, capabilities that um, uh, Arnell mentioned right before we transitioned into this was kind of focused on the synchronous game. A lot of the work that I've done on it recently has been for the synchronous uh, settings where you've got everybody on a Zoom call like this um, and um, uh, you're uh, trying to, to facilitate a, a single game where you've got People that are looking at different screens, if you're not using something like this or trying to do it over uh, Excel uh, and uh, um, PowerPoint. Uh, but this gives you a central uh, hub to be able to, 
conduct those games, or if you're playing an asynchronous game, teams log in when they can, coordinate their actions, and uh, and go from there. So with that, I will stop uh, my sharing, and I will open it up for questions. And uh, Arnell, let me know if you want me to jump back and uh, and cover anything yeah. that may not have hit. No, hopefully, and Ben's hopefully still there, and he's already been answering some of the questions in the chat. So thanks for that, Ben. No, thank you both very much for that. Um, a lot of gold dust and a lot of great insights there. I mean, I think it's worth mentioning, you know, when we talk war gaming, and that's why I think even Ben and you, you mentioned, Tom, we're talking about something more broader in its remake, because I think a lot of military folks will think war gaming, comparing courses of action, um, war gaming when you're doing your military decision making process, but what we're actually arguing is something broader indeed, you know, something bigger. And so for reason why I thought this panel is important, and hopefully some of you found it useful is that I mean, I think we have ethical obligation for most of us as professionals, whether we're in the military or civilians in the agency. I mean, everyone on here, I think you can see from the community that's participating is going to deal with complexity, you know, specifically complex adaptive systems. And so all of us should be thinking about how do our actions, our, our, our operations and activities have effects, on, second and third order effects on a population or different nation states or different actors and groups. So how do you do that? How do you start to think about that? And obviously, we're arguing here. If you do some more gaming and simulations, you may tease some of that out and start to open up your imagination to what's possible and get the creative juices flowing. But this is hard stuff, and you guys have been doing it well. That's why I thought you guys were the perfect ones to kind of help share your experiences and uh, been you know all of you been good friends for a while and, and, and been doing all this, watching what you've been doing with war gaming. It's been incredible. And so we got some good questions coming in. So uh, thanks for that. I, um, Daniel, do you, are you able to just turn on your mic and ask your question? Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, uh, good. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so just for, for context, I know I kind of wrote it out there, but um, one of the last major training exercises I participated in was, you know, Warfighter, and the CA staff kind of was struggling to, um, I don't want to be reductive, but for lack of a better term, get the commander to care, right? Uh, it was far easier for him to care about, you know, the the simulated tanks and BMPs or other op four that were treading his forces than this vague idea of, oh, their IDPs clogging uh, clogging up roads, causing humanitarian crises. And so that's always kind of stuck with me is how do we incorporate these ideas of, of, of CA related gaming into already existing platforms that are driving decision making and, and uh, uh, driving a lot of these exercises within the conventional force or even in the, the special operations force over. And you want to take that? Go ahead, Ben. You're still muted, brother. There we go. My, my fat fingers were just kept doing this. Uh, what I was going to say is that you're right. The entire way we, we simulate war is if people don't exist. They're just targets to be killed. And the only way they matter is if they're in a particularly well-placed to make a decision or they're in a particular piece of equipment that adjusts relative combat power. It is a fundamental flaw. You will not beat that flaw. So what you have to do is as you're planning the warfighter in advance, get good commanders to buy in to the use of decision forcing cases or vignettes where you can hit pause or afterwards and say, all right, in this scenario, what would you do? So kind of add an old style Moltke kind of decision game to analog weave in to the middle of that warfighter. Now finding the right time, getting the chief of staff buy-in, no guarantees, but that's the way I would do it. And that answers the second question on the thread. What's the shortest you've ever seen games? Um, at the School of Advanced Warfighting, I did an experiment. The students all have to submit to me a game that can be played in 30 minutes or less. Uh, the reason for that was so they really focused on the one particular research question and argument that the game was solved around. Um, otherwise, you start to build in too much complexity inadvertently. So I think you can do these very quick. It's obviously just a question of what's the trade off and the right level of abstraction. Over. Hey, Tom, you have anything to add on that? No, I think that was a good, uh, good response. Um, you know, I, I think. You know, just by the um, force, as you go through your own war game, which is, you know, develop your arguments or, or your, uh, the weaknesses in the plan that you're trying to provide injects into, like I said, the process of doing that war game helps sharpen your arguments, I, I think, and by the time you're able to provide those injects, 
that, uh, you know, that argument's a little bit, you know, hits a little closer to home for that commander. Uh, and I think simply going through that process will help you uh, identify those things that, uh, that the commander will care about. Uh, and it's just kind of a, a way of thinking about the problem in arguments uh, and, uh, and relationships that, that uh, are going to matter to the commander. And he has to be willing to, he or she has to be willing to, uh, to hear that argument when it's presented. That's uh, one thing out of your hands. A great question, Daniel. I mean, just to tack on a final point there. I mean, you, sometimes you get to, you, in your section or wherever, you're, whatever level you're at, you can just you can execute some of these different war games. Like they don't take too much effort, and um, it might just help your command out by saying, "We war game this for you." Here's the one page findings, saving you time, something to think about uh, to get them thinking. Basir, go. I see your hand up, brother. Go ahead with your question. Pretty big one there about Putin. Yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I delivered the trading to a uh, uh, civic reservist uh, within NATO uh, this summer, and uh, I used a uh, uh, Professor Goodmanson. Uh, you know, uh, Professor Jensen wonderfully brought the uh, DCFs, uh, DFC, sorry, uh, uh, case method, and uh, I've actually uh, decided to use it during a training and I think the key is adrenaline and uh, you know a lot of uh, stress hormones suspense thrill so when you add the suspense and the thrill uh, to a degree uh, certain stressors or worries and so forth that really gets people going and I think uh, yeah so hats off uh, to Marine Corps and uh, <laughs> Professor Jensen cheers thanks Yeah, uh, Jeremiah, I saw your your, uh, your comment there. I don't know if you want to comment on that for the group, be able to unmute. Uh, yes, sir. So um, we do an information warfighter exercise war game. It's actually done a couple of times a year, but the main one is done in Quantico in the fall, in October, September, October. And we usually have a pretty large, robust multinational response with uh, people from like Australia, Japan, the Brits come out, Netherlands to participate in this and it's a warfighter exercise. Part of it is tactical. We have some of the more enlisted guys going out and doing actual lanes and the, the actual war game piece, um, which was developed by RAND, uses, for lack of a better term, all the IRCs doing um, a war game, which includes, you know, green cell and civil affairs in it. So if anybody's interested in the 2023 IWX, we'd be more than happy to have uh, your participation and if you want to hit me up, it's all awesome. Hey, thanks, Jeremiah. Appreciate you sharing that. So I got a good question here from uh, Dennis Cahill. Um, and then we both, Ben and Tom, kind of talked to us a little bit. But ben, Dennis, are you able to unmute, sir? Sure, I know. Hi. <clears throat> well, you know, I, I've seen a lot of our uh, military commanders and planners reluctant to talk about DOD and supporting role uh, to humanitarian, not you know, just stabiliz stabilization operations. And I was just wondering, I mean, they're very complex, obviously, and, and, and are probably as, as complex as, as uh, combat operations. And we often, I think, find ourselves a little bit falling short uh, of having the right resources in the right place when it comes to those uh, kinds of operations. So I was just wondering if any of these workings have been built around that kind of uh, operation. Over. Uh, go to Ben first and then Tom. I know you've both done this. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think my fear is not that we're going to suck at great power conflict. My fear is that we're going to completely punt and forget everything we've done, stability operations to include counterinsurgency. Um, and all sorts of just strange variations in between, whether that's what's going on in the Horn of Africa or other moments where at one second you're dealing with a refugee crisis that quickly turns into a complex humanitarian emergency. I, I think you're spot on. Um, and most of the work that I do in this space is actually for USAID and state and not for the US military. We were trying to do it with the Security Force Assistance Command until the Columbia incident happened. Um, and that kind of uh, forced us to pull back. But the, exactly what your concerns about or what DARPA is concerned about as well. And I think starting left of crisis, how do we actually make sense of these environments? Most people are connected. So you've all seen this, right? We can go to a place where you can't drink the water. 
Um, and it's maybe not the safest place, but everyone's still got a phone that's at least 3G and is passing information. Yet we do very little to collect the ambient information in a way that allows us to make assessments about what's going on in the environment. Um, little little uh, bad war story. So the end of the Afghan conflict, I was dual-headed to run the CGIAC, so the Combined Joint Intelligence Operations Center for Afghanistan. So I had 40 analysts basically just writing, like, here is the next district to fall reports as we were beginning to really retrograde the final basis. So at this point, we're still talking. We were still at Bagram. Um, we'd already been out of Kandahar and most of the other installations. Just leave it there. So one of the intelligence requirements I needed uh, that I kept pushing was, hey, this isn't going to be you know, whether or not the last of the humid sources say something. I need to know the food and fuel prices in four major regional cities and the outbound ticket prices from Kabul to Dubai. If you can give me those bits of atmospheric information, I can tell you with a higher confidence how quickly the collapse is coming. Our entire intelligence community is not equipped to do that at all. Um, and we sure as shit aren't equipped to collect that information and analyze it statistically since most of our versions of Excel disable data analysis packets in SCIFs for even unclassified for reasons I still don't fully understand. So we have a problem of actually collecting just a data centric rich world and letting it reveal itself and then even analyzing it. So when I've done it, it through games, I, I like what uh, the other uh, the other presenter is saying. It really is forcing people to structure cause and effect arguments that you can then test or at least think of the argument deductively as it emerged from the game, and then begin to do your own thought experiments of testing it versus real world scenarios. But I think we need to do a lot more, not just with gaming, but actually collecting that information and trying to predict what's where are there increased risk propensities so that we can, you know, deal with these things? Because Ukraine's not going to be the end of this. I mean, no one wants to talk about it, but how quick until the Polish population or others turn against Ukrainian refugees? One more winter? Two? Um, what happens with all those surplus weapons? I, I remember getting my deployment started in the Balkans, and I have some ideas. Um, so being able to quickly make sense of, of kind of those types of complexities, whether through gaming, data, or heaven forbid, a combination of the two, I think is an absolute priority. Over. Thanks, Ben. Tom, any, any thoughts on that? No, I think uh, the, all great comments. Uh, and, I, and I think one of the important aspects of this is that in any type of situation where you're supporting uh, another host nation that uh, by, almost by definition, uh, you're in a, uh, a resource constrained environment from the use uh, from the US side. Um, so it's important in your war game that you take or, or you go through the process of trying to figure out where can you get the most bang for your buck uh, as you invest those limited resources in multiple uh, options where you've got demand signals for capabilities needed across the country. So I think wargaming is at least a way that you can start to address, you know, where can you expend your limited assets uh, in a way that has uh, has the highest impact. Thanks, guys. So Diana's got a good question here. Diana, do you have the ability to unmic or unmute yourself? Sure. And ask? Oh, there sure. you go. I think you can hear me, right? Um, uh, and so, hey, Ben, thanks. Uh, it's good to see you again. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, the USAID uh, war gaming we worked on, Grayson, was the example that you used today. Um, I do have a question because I'm kind of thinking about this in terms of not so much for our in, internal sort of concept development, um, uh, but more as, a, as like a wargaming as an exportable capability for civil affairs. I think one of the things that from a CA perspective, we, we do have great power is, is bringing folks together. Um, and I, I've heard today in recent conversations, a lot, a lot around the language of building resilience, building resilience um, in the competition space. Um, and so I was, I was curious, you know, from the perspective of exporting this or, or doing similar sort of exercises in with partner nations um, that we might might be in the field working with um, if you can offer any sort of uh, contextual or cultural sort of challenges um, one of the ones that I was kind of thinking about um, um, that came to mind is for example when you're talking with indo-pacific partners they don't want to use counter china sort of language especially when you're talking about in the the mistis malinformation space they use usually what is is more uh, 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 the, the the language that works better is uh, working to um, 
working on the information environment as it relates to human security. But I was just curious if you, if you had any any uh, suggestions um, that you could offer in in some of the, the contexts that we might find ourselves. Thanks. Um, and you want to comment, Tom, first? Any, any thoughts there? And we just, I'll, as you're getting ready, I mean, we just met with the Department of State. Uh, I just met with them a few days uh, last week about some of the wargaming efforts that they're looking to do um, in this regard. And so we'll, I'll make a plug at the end here for how we're going to go forward and, and do some of that. Yeah, uh, I mean, from my perspective, uh, I, I have involved, I have not been involved in any attempt to export, you know, provide a war gaming in a box type capability. Uh, I mean, I think that's kind of what you're getting at where you've got, where you bring a capability to an external organization that has to go through the process of using war games uh, to solve the processes that you're, uh, or the problems that they're trying to address. So I haven't been involved in that directly, but, you know, I, I think trying to figure out how to abstract the key dynamics of a, of a game and provide it in a in a format um, that uh, that you know a relatively new user can can get up and running on pretty quickly would be key um, you know i've seen some at pack sims where they've got uh, you know the matrix uh, war game that's uh, you know can be uh, modified for specific purposes um, but uh, you know i haven't provided a lot of a, a lot of thought maybe um, ben's got some some thoughts on on, on a way to to do that Yeah. You're still muted, brother. I'll get that right eventually. <laughs> um, I think the first, uh, you know, answer is simplicity matters. So uh, some people will flip out when I say this, but, you know, because some people say it's not a game unless there's two and it's adversarial. But I think the easiest way to do it is to design kind of 1.5 style games where it's really a decision game with unknown to the participants, a random assignment into one of two different scenarios, and then just having a conversation. Usually when we're working with partners, the goal is to build interoperability, which is both technical, procedural, and human. So a game can really focus on those second two, the, inter, the procedural, just understanding how they even look at the problem, how they define it, what do they see as choices they could make, and then human, having that conversation together to build that relationship. So I think the smartest way to do it would almost be you know, we have to kind of seed the force with people who know how to write simple decision games. That's why we're trying to build that into the advanced planning curriculum at SAW um, so that people could make that decision and design it and design it usually in a way that could be used. Now, to your point about the cultural considerations, I'm a huge believer in using a fake country um, just because it's not just that it allows people to be comfortable talking about it. It also allows you to focus on the problem at hand in a way that doesn't inadvertently smuggle in bad assumptions or skewed assumptions about yourself or an adversary. Um, so it's, it's just usually a fake, country. depending on the nature of the question, a fake country goes a long way. So again, I think the way to do it, and I've actually been a fan with the stuff we've been doing with the, that initial aid group. We just did a version of it. Um, the one in Prague was very similar. It actually does a really good job of a simple and up the design to generate really nuanced perspectives. In that case, it wasn't fake. Nobody had any problem talking about malign Russian and Chinese influence in Central East and Eastern Europe. Um, they were all over it. Uh, so if I was in a place where I was worried about that, I would just design it as fake countries. Uh, we did that even for the Solarium Commission with cyber um, operations and Congress, just because, because it was a bipartisan commission, even admitting at that point, even though it was substantiated that Russia tried to influence the election was so charged. We just made scenarios around two entities called orange and purple. Um, and we just smuggled all of the complexities of how a state could intervene in a society using uh, cyber operations into those scenarios. So nobody had to say Russia, no one had to you know, get involved with Secretary Clinton's emails, just left all that out by using the fake country, which I'm a big fan of, over. Good stuff, good stuff. So I know we're approaching the top of the hour here and don't see any more big questions coming in. So I'm gonna ask you guys to close us out with some, you know, some parting thoughts about wargaming and why this still, you know, as you already have, you know, why it matters, but any helpful final thoughts for the, for the community. And I'll make one, you know, as you prepare that, 
I'll make one shameless plug here for uh, coming out this spring. You know, thanks to the help of the Solar Purse Association, um, we have a new book called Warrior Diplomats with contributing authors from across the uh, interrange sea. Different, you know, we have a marine chapter, um, some SF guys, and it's just a mix of uh, contributors. So that book will come out this spring. Uh, we'll keep everyone posted to the Solar Purse Association. Um, so really excited about that. And so finally, uh, just Big thanks to you too. I uh, really appreciate you guys doing this for us and, and, and sharing your thoughts. Um, you've been doing this for a while, and I think it's been I think it's been really fruitful for us to to hear all those different thoughts. So, I mean, at, at this what big takeaway for me from listening to you both, you know, there's a lot of stuff. Facilitation is really hard. Um, you can do this at all the levels. Tom has a really great tool, this this matrix game facilitation tool, but it just helps make it easier for you to facilitate a game. It could be small or large, um, asynchronous or synchronous, um, but Bottom line is you can do this. Anyone should be, and we should be doing this prior to conducting operations so that we can kind of do the, you know, the necessary thinking game before or thinking about these things, these activities or development, whatever it is we're doing before we go out and do it for real. Because lots, you know, sometimes lives hang in the balance. It's high stakes situations and uh, we, you know, we have an ethical obligation to do that. So I'll go over to uh, Ben first and then Tom, any parting thoughts? Of course you don't have a mute button on. <laughs> I said something amazing. No, I just, I, you know, games for me aren't about games. It's about, and Tom has really hit this, about the quality of argumentation. The military profession, even though we don't acknowledge it, is built on the idea that there are general principles, almost like geometry or mathematical proofs that govern the exercise of violence. I don't agree with that, uh, but I do think that we have to force ourselves to be clear about cause and effect relationships in our arguments. There's a great line in On War, but no one reads, where Clausewitz actually tries to define his method and talks about three things, identifying equivocal facts, so uncertainty, um, tracing effects back to their cause, so making actual causal arguments that explain the variation in what you're seeing, and only then can you evaluate the means employed. Now, he was proposing that as a way of looking at historical cases to hone judgment for looking at the future of war. I think games offer a kind of fast track way into that method about alternative futures you're imagining. So there was a comment in there about terminology and not confusing with formal war games. Couldn't disagree more. Um, the formal war games that we normally do as part of the planning process are fairly a bit broken. Um, and increasingly, I see my better planners that I work with using games and decision exercises as part of design problem framing and early on to force people to clarify assumptions as they begin to initiate planning. So I also think it's not just that there's an interest in gaming. I think we're about to see a seismic shift in how we understand what a game is in relation to the entire planning process with plans being a hypothesis we're testing against a still unfolding environment um, or an assumption about a future environment as a contingency. So game, game more, force yourself though to analyze the answers. It can't just be a bunch of people making stuff up and feeling cool about it. There's got to be some rigorous method for evaluating it, whether it's a matrix style argument or heaven forbid, sprinkle a little social science in there and actually test people's claims over. Beautiful, Ben. Thanks for that. We even in the master Clausewitz. Love it. Over to you, Tom. Yeah, so I think the, the future of uh, wargaming looks pretty bright. Uh, there's a lot of uh, effort going in in places like Georgetown to train the next uh, generation of wargamers, which I, I think, uh, you know, that capability of atrophied for a little while, and, and it seems like uh, it's on its way back. Um, and there is growing interest in the social sciences with war games. Uh, you know, one of the central problems for international relations, particularly, is that there's relatively few cases to study, you know, of major wars. So war gaming is one way that uh, social sciences are trying to create these cases uh, that are worthy of study. And, and there's just starting to come out, I think, in the last couple of years uh, where uh, international relations is starting to take war gaming seriously. Um, and, you know, good case methodology uh, that's in the social sciences can also be used uh, at your organization for testing those hypotheses, making your strong arguments, seeing whether or not that cause and effect uh, relationship holds over different types of conditions uh, as you war game it. Uh, and I think the, the other point that I would uh, leave you with is that DOD right now is drowning in bureaucracy and it's incredibly frustrating. Um, and I really think that one of the things that war gamers need to take on uh, is how to break through the bureaucracy. You know, I think we had one question that kind of touched on that, 
um, that if, if there is a future that matters for war gamers, uh, given where our bureaucracy is right now for DOD, it's how do, do, how do war gamers break through that bureaucracy with compelling arguments in a way that affects the decision makers uh, calculus. Um, and as we start to uh, approach this more seriously and we get a little bit more rigorous in our methods, uh, I, I think that's where the future of wargaming leads. And, and it's probably going to start in uh, capabilities such as your own in civil affairs, information operations, because um, you are outnumbered at the table uh, when uh, when you come to bring in a recommendation. So having the uh, the cases or the arguments and the relationships among the variables that you're addressing um, is going to carry the weight, um, and it's just a matter of trying to figure out how you make your arguments uh, the loudest uh, or, or most compelling. Uh, and finally, I'll close with my own shameless plug. If you're interested in Warpaths, uh, please reach out, um, and uh, I'll be happy to set you up with a free trial, set up your war game, invite a couple people, see how it works out for you, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. I'll put my uh, email in the uh, in the comments, so I'll close with that. Wonderful. Thanks for that, Tom. Yeah, if, if, if any of you guys want to stay up more on this war gaming stuff you know shoot us a note um we'll be doing games uh different types over the next coming months uh, with the interagency um so please reach out to us and, and and like they both said they both are great human beings always want to help us out make us better and, and like tom said you know if you want to improve our, our craft as civil affairs professionals most of most of us are i mean the games can really help so thanks for being a great audience and if you're time this afternoon but we'll, we'll leave it there um unless uh do I have anybody else from the Civil Affairs Association? Uh, General Stock, will you on, sir? Okay. Oh, there you go, Chris Olshay. Go ahead, sir. Hey, uh, wow. Really rich discussion. Um, boy, we got a lot about a lot to write about here on the uh, report. Um, well, I don't know if you were there for uh, General Burpair's, uh kind of dropped the gauntlet this morning and asked us to uh, provide some real substantial uh, feedback from this symposium on what he's trying to do and get on the way forward. And I'll, I'll have that fully articulated, everybody. But, um, but we're well on our way. And, and uh, certainly one of the things I, as I listen to this, I, I think wargaming, uh, or I don't know what you want to call it, peace gaming, wargaming, the, peace, this, the peacekeeping community would cer certainly be able to join us if we uh, call it peace. They do a lot of that. And that might be a consideration, by the way, because um, they certainly have a lot of things that they've done best practices wise that uh, we we may not have to duplicate in terms of understanding civil societies and, and that are uh, either uh, fragile or uh, failing. Uh, so that that consideration. Um, and the other thing I know that you are you are very interested in, and I think everybody else is too, is is how does AI fit in all? Um, how how would AI help us um, in, that, in this regard? So that might be uh, something to think about, maybe for the future, and may in fact be a, a amazing topic. In general. How do we, how civil affairs? I think is one of the, the capabilities in the military that stands most to gain from the use of AI uh, to be a have a huge huge impact. On the force and inner, inner agency's ability to understand the scene and influence. Um, so that those are my remarks. Um, 